Hi, my name's Eric. I'll be reading you selections from the e-edition of today's New Bedford's Standard Times, dated today, Monday, August 12th of 2024. We'll start with weather, as we always do across the South Coast today, partly sunny, high of 80, low of 60 expected. Tomorrow, Tuesday, a blend of sun and clouds, nice day, high of 80, low of 59. Wednesday, partly sunshine, high of 82, low of 60. Thursday looks to be partly sunny as well, high of 81, low of 63. Friday gets a little more humid with sun and clouds, but we have a beautiful week ahead, nice and dry until Friday, and uh, pretty much a sunny week ahead. So get outside if you can, feel that sun on your face, that'd be nice. From the front page of today's Standard Times, dated August 12th, former fire chief's shooting is justified. Intoxicated and angry Coderre shot at police by Frank Mulligan in New Bedford. The fatal shooting of former New Bedford Deputy Fire Chief Paul Coderre, Jr., by police during a December standoff at the Bayside Lounge in Fairhaven was justified. The Bristol County District Attorney's Office released that finding in a 19-page investigation report on Thursday, which was based on eyewitness accounts, including from his wife, as well as police and two civilian videos. The police video was collected from three police body cameras and one dash-mounted cruiser camera. According to the report, the events unfolded on Friday, December 29th of 2023, at about 4.50 p.m., when, Fair Fa- when Fairhaven police were called to the lounge, reports of an intoxicated man in the parking lot. Police were told by a 911 caller several people were trying to prevent the man from driving. Three Fairhaven police officers responded in three separate cruisers. As the first officer approached the group in the parking lot, Kader took an aggressive stance and moved his hand toward his hip, according to the report. The officer drew his firearm and retreated to his cruiser, believing that Coderre was reaching for a weapon. He was joined by the other two officers, and they called for mutual aid from the Akushnet and Mattapoisett police departments when Coderre, that's C-O-D-E-R-R-E, refused to surrender his weapon. Numerous officers responded and formed a perimeter around Coderre. Officers repeatedly tried to de-escalate the situation, according to the report, and several of Coderre's friends were allowed to speak to him. All verbal attempts to convince him to surrender his weapon failed, the report states. It added that Coderre appeared intoxicated and repeatedly threatened to shoot himself. He told officers he wouldn't fire at them. He would either shoot himself or make officers shoot him, according to the report. The standoff lasted approximately 30 minutes. Police tried to use non-lethal methods to apprehend Kader. He was hit twice with a taser, but this was ineffective, and he pulled the second taser prong out with his hands. Police then tried a bola wrap device, which is used to restrain a person by a tether, but it failed to wrap around him. Police then tried firing a beanbag round at him from a shotgun, and it struck him, but failed to incapacitate him. The officer tried to fire twice more, but both bags misfired in the shotgun. Coderre then pulled a 9mm semi-automatic pistol from a holster on his right hip and began firing at officers who had been prepared to tackle him when the non-lethal devices were used. And a Kushnet police officer was shot in the leg, which turned out to be a minor injury. And then four police officers fired and Coderre was hit five times. He fell to the ground where officers provided medical attention and he was declared dead at St. Luke's Hospital at 6.10 p.m. The time from the first taser deployment to Coderre falling to the ground was approximately 12 seconds, according to the report. Eight spent shell casings from Coderre's gun were recovered at the scene, along with 23 from the officer's guns. A magazine found on Coderre's body contained seven more live rounds. There were two live rounds left in his pistol. The 55-year-old Dartmouth resident had a license to carry firearms, had been part owner of a gun shop, was a former firearms instructor, and had owned 39 firearms, according to the report. The report notes Coderre was accused of faking an injury to avoid work 
and claimed disability while with the New Bedford Fire Department several years earlier. He had been involved in litigation with the city for two years and had recently won a ruling with the Civil Service Commission that found his termination and pension denial to be unlawful. However, the report noted that the city had appealed to Bristol County Superior Court on the day of the incident. Coderre was an active member of the Bristol County Fire Chiefs Association, according to the report. Some members of the group would meet Fridays at the lounge for lunch and drinks, including on the day of the shooting. One member said he'd had breakfast that morning with Coderre, who was upbeat about his civil service case. He later received a call from his attorney at lunch about the city appeal, and he got, quote-unquote, a little pissed off. Another member, described as a good friend of Coderre, said Coderre was upset about the city's recent decision regarding his termination. He had several drinks, and then he ordered shots for the group twice, once in honor of a former chief who had committed suicide. The friend called Coderre's wife, saying Coderre would need a ride home. When Coderre's wife arrived, she tried to get him to drive home with her, according to the report, and she took his key fob. Coderre punched out the driver's side window of his pickup truck to get its spare keys that were inside, according to the second witness. He injured his hand and arm doing so. He was upset that his wife had been called and grabbed the second witness by the throat, according to the report. They tried to calm him down, but he was enraged, the second witness said. Coderre's wife asked if he had a gun. He replied yes and fired a shot into the air. The witness said he made a statement to the effect that the three of us are not going to go home today. Coderre was verbally aggressive with his wife when arguing over the key fob. She said that was highly unusual for him, as was grabbing the other man by the throat. She said he was not normally an angry drunk and believed he had had a psychotic break. Another friend came out of the lounge to help. A witness said Coderre pointed the gun at his wife before he fired it into the air. His wife hid behind her car and heard Coderre yell, I'm going to die today. People called from the lounge for her to come inside, which she did. While inside, she heard the multiple gunshots that were fired and everyone in the bar got on the ground. Coderre's wife said the civil service litigation and publicity had been stressful and upsetting to Coderre. He had also been told that he couldn't have any more surgeries for the back injury that led to his disability leave. He would have to receive pain management therapy. She said he was prescribed medication for his pain and his mood. The medication had recently been changed and he seemed more agitated after the switch, she said. Along with the interactions described in the report, video also recorded Coderre saying he was dying tonight, as well as the situation was going to end one of two ways. You guys are going to shoot me or I'm going to shoot me. This is how this is going to end. And don't lose any sleep over this. This is my decision. According to the autopsy, Coderre's blood alcohol content was .202, more than twice the legal limit to drive. The report concluded the fatal shooting of Paul Coderre Jr. was justified as the result of Mr. Coderre's actions on December 29th of 2023. Based on a review of all the facts and circumstances related to this incident, there's no basis to conclude that the responding police officers committed a crime. The other story on the front page of today's Standard Times, Healy says fate of hospitals is in the hands of the lenders by Michael P. Norton of the Statehouse News Service in Boston. Describing herself as pleased that a federal court approved state aid to continue operations at Stewart Healthcare Hospitals, Governor Maura T. Healy said Wednesday that things are moving quickly toward the potential transfer of five threatened Massachusetts hospitals to new owners. Things are moving quickly, I think, right now in the bankruptcy court, Healy told reporters at the State House. I'm cautiously optimistic, but it's right now in the hands of the lenders. An attorney representing Stewart told the court Tuesday that Medical Properties Trust and Macquarie Infrastructure Partners reached an agreement in principle with their lender, Apollo Global Management, to hand over the property on which Stewart's Massachusetts hospitals are located. Further, significant progress has been made in terms of both the commercial terms and the purchase agreements with respect to the sale of the hospital real property and operations to the bidders for the Massachusetts hospitals, each of which are high-quality local 
operators, David Cohen, an attorney from Wheel, Gottschall & Menge, who represents Stewart on Tuesday, told Judge Christopher Lopez. Stewart has seven hospitals in Massachusetts on eight campuses, and it plans to close two, Kearney Hospital in Dorchester and Neshoba Valley Medical Center in Ayr, at the end of August. Supporters of those two hospitals are rallying to save them, but Healy said she's focused on the five others. We continue to encourage the lenders to reach that deal. Apollo Global Management and the landlords need to reach and finalize the deal so that the five other hospitals can continue, Healy said Wednesday. Cohen said Tuesday that it was a sign of the significant progress being made that Massachusetts state government was prepared to enter into a $30 million funding agreement with Steward to allow the parties to continue to advance negotiations and sign purchase agreements in the coming days all with the goal of being back in front of your honor next week seeking approval of such sales. Lopez is expected to hold an August 13th hearing related to the sales of Good Samaritan Medical Center in Brockton, Morton Hospital in Taunton, St. Anne's Hospital in Fall River, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Brighton, and Holy Family Hospital with campuses in Methuen and Haverhill. On Tuesday, Healy said that, unfortunately, there was no bid that came forward that qualified for Kearney and Neshoba and that she was focused on saving five community hospitals. In a July 30th court filing, the Massachusetts Nurses Association questioned Stewart's claims about the lack of qualified bids. Quote, the debtors fail to explain what is meant by actionable or viable bids, nor do the debtors assert that they did not receive offers for Kearney and Neshoba Valley, Sam Alberts of Denton's wrote in the nurses' union file. Nor can they. Based upon information and belief, including the language in the motions, both hospitals received bids from at least one potential purchaser. Why the debtors have determined bids for Neshoba Valley and Kearney are not actionable? is unknown, as the debtors have failed to provide MNA with copies of bids despite requ- repeated requests and approved bid procedures that were intended to provide MNA with a role in the sales process. As part of the court-approved closings, Stewart is planning 753 layoffs at Kearney and 490 at Neshoba Valley for August 31st, according to Worker Adjustment and Retraining Act, notices. My heart goes out to folks, both health care workers who are affected by all of this and certainly patients or those who are concerned about receiving care in the community, Healy told reporters. As governor, I don't want to see people not having access to health care. I don't want to see health care workers out of jobs. Healy said that if there are closures, the state will work to ensure that workers have access to resources that they need, and also that patients have clear direction and guidance as to where they can go and where they can get the health care that they need. Moving from the front page to a different kind of local news, there is one death notice. There's no obituaries, just a death notice today for Kenneth R. Babineau, who at the age of 75 passed on July 31st. Arrangements are with Obertine Lopes Funeral Home, and the uh, the services will be on August 14th at 11 a.m. That's this coming Wednesday. And we have finished the local news then, because that's all there is. Two stories and a death notice. And move to the national and international news. The headline on page three, Trump's personal attacks raise questions. Some say 2024 campaign is starting to feel like 2016 by Zach Anderson and David Jackson of USA Today. The calendar says 2024, but for Donald Trump and his Republican presidential campaign, the last few days have felt like 2016 all over again. Trump has ditched his post-assassination attempt unity argument and rebuffed calls from his party's elected stalwarts who'd prefer their presidential nominee focus on Democrats' policies. Instead, the former president, who hopes voters will send him back to the White House in November, has settled into a familiar series of deeply personal attacks on his Democratic opponent, including inflammatory remarks about her race. Trump isn't just battling with his partisan rivals, he also continues to feud with wayward Republicans and to focus on his personal obsessions, 
such as crowd size. The GOP presidential nominee once was thought to be running a more disciplined campaign, but not anymore, as he struggles to adjust to facing Vice President Kamala Harris instead of President Joe Biden in a contest that just a few weeks ago seemed over, and now it's back to a toss-up status. Key battleground states steadily are shifting away from Trump's outright favor as Harris boosts Democratic enthusiasm, raising large sums of money and drawing big crowds. Unable to counteract Harris's momentum and increasingly lashing out with harsher attacks that are reminiscent of 2016, some in Trump's party view his latest tactics as counterproductive, even if they previously proved effective in delivering him the presidency. Trump should stick to issues and values and avoid demeaning personality attacks. Former U.S. House Speaker Newt Gingrich, who's a close Trump ally who was a finalist to be his running mate in 2016, told USA Today, The personal attacks boomerang, and they hurt Trump, quote-unquote. A rookie politician who had long been famous for his real estate and media ventures, Trump shocked and offended most of the country nine years ago from the moment he came down the escalator in Trump Tower and declared his presidential bid with a screed against undocumented immigrants. Trump won in 2016 despite a long list of inflammatory remarks from the Access Hollywood tape that captured him bragging about just being able to grab a woman's genitals to disputing that now deceased U.S. Senator John McCain wasn't a war hero (laughs) after his time as a prisoner in Vietnam. Trump returned to his caustic ways in 2020, but by then the incumbent president was facing significant backlash after four years of a chaotic and controversial White House. He slammed Biden as Sleepy Joe, repeatedly questioned his mental fitness, and accused him of running a basement campaign for president during the deadly coronavirus pandemic. The Republican president ended up losing states such as Georgia and Arizona that Democrats hadn't carried in years. Many in the GOP have bristled at various times over Trump's approach, but most have eventually rallied around him. Fast forward to 2024, and Republicans are concerned that Trump seems to be returning to that 2016 formula as he struggles to change the trajectory of the current race. He has labeled Harris as low IQ, questioned her racial identity, and mocked her name, which has left some in the party uncomfortable and critics calling him racist. While much of, that, while much of what Trump has done in the past was viewed as controversial, a mistake, or undisciplined, he often came away without being hurt politically, and in some cases his efforts may have even helped him. Some analysts believe Trump's tactics may be less effective now. They're going to have a hard time creating the same animosity toward Harris in two months that Hillary Clinton created over 25 years, said Mike Duhame, a GOP consultant and the former political director for the RNC, the Republican National Committee, who argued Harris has much less baggage than Clinton and will be harder to demonize. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that Trump's then-unique approach to campaigning in 2016 could be problematic in 2024. Back then, many voters found Trump's slash-and-burn style to be refreshing, novel, and direct. Eight years later, analysts say, Trump's aggressive attacks come across as mean, repetitive, and out of touch. Pollster Frank Luntz said voters who in 2016 found Trump to be candid, outspoken, and direct are looking for more substance in 2024, but he warned they're not getting it from the former president. The public is starting to say enough already, said Luntz, who conducts focus groups of voters and has worked for GOP candidates in the past. Enough with being mean. Just do your job. Trump can't win with just his conservative base, Luntz said. He has to reach out to more moderate voters who are increasingly turned off by Trump's long-used tactics. And as a result, Harris is emerging as a front-runner in the newly configured presidential race. With the Trump campaign struggling to define Harris negatively, the Democratic Convention will give her a chance to try to cement a more positive view among voters while honing criticism of her Republican rival as selfish, dangerous, and unhinged. Trump is the first former president convicted of a crime, and he still faces additional federal and state charges to which he's pleaded not guilty.
Trump's chaotic and slapdash campaign style is exposing him to questions about his mental acuity, the same kinds of issues he once raised against 81-year-old Biden. Trump turned 78 in June and has become the oldest major party nominee in history, and his tactics are now being turned against him in that context. Yet even as Harris has completely changed the dynamics of the race, Trump still appears to have a strong chance of winning. Political handicappers have moved more swing states into toss-up territory, but polling averages show the race essentially remains tied in the states that matter most. And surveys indicate Trump still has an advantage on key issues such as immigration and the economy. Harris changes the race from age and capacity to ideology and performance, Gingrich said. The more Trump can focus on the performance gap and the issue differences, the more likely he will defeat her. While Luntz said the campaign is still Trump's to lose, the prominent pollster quickly added, he's in the process of losing it. Our next headline in the Standard Times of Monday, August 12th, FDA OK's first spray for severe allergic reactions by Adriana Rodriguez of USA Today. The Food and Drug Administration approved a new nasal spray on Friday as the first needle-free emergency treatment for potentially fatal allergic reactions. The spray, which is made by ARS Pharmaceuticals and sold under the brand name Nephi, N-E-F-F-Y, is seen as an alternative to EpiPens and other auto-injectors that are filled with epinephrine, a life-saving drug used by people at risk of anaphylaxis and other allergic reactions. Anaphylaxis is a severe life-threatening allergic reaction that typically involves multiple parts of the body, and it's a medical emergency. Research estimates anaphylaxis may cause up to 200 deaths each year. Nephi, which is a single-dose nasal spray that can be administered into one nostril, was approved for use in adult and pediatric patients who weigh at least 66 pounds. The Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America said the nasal spray may remove some barriers that prevent people from using epinephrine, especially for children who may be afraid of needles. The needle-free device removes the fear of needle-based injections, and it may be easier to use, said Kathy Prachaura, community vice president at AAFA. This may increase confidence among people managing life-threatening allergies. Nephi's approval is based on four studies in 175 healthy adults without anaphylaxis that measured the epinephrine concentrations in the blood following the administration of Nephi or approved epinephrine injection products. Last year, the U.S. health regulator declined to approve the spray and requested additional testing, a decision that went against the recommendation of its independent experts. There's no preparation or activation necessary before using Nephi, Richard Lowenthal, co-founder and CEO of ARS Pharma, told USA Today last year. The device works similarly to Narcan, the nasal spray that reverses opioid overdoses. You grab the device, you put it in somebody's nose, and you press the plunger at the bottom of the device and it will snap and spray the medicine, he said. The person doesn't need to be breathing or snort the medication, he said. It's automatically absorbed by the nasal mucosa. This isn't possible with normal epinephrine, which isn't absorbed in the nose if taken from a vial. However, the new nasal spray has a solvent that gets between cells in the nose and helps the body absorb epinephrine. The most reported side effects include mild nasal discomfort, headaches, runny nose, nausea, moderate dizziness, moderate vomiting, and mild throat irritation. And Reuters contributed to that report. The next headline, Swift Plot Suspects Lawyer Downplays Attack Plan, says clients explosive wouldn't have worked. In Vienna, the lawyer of the main suspect in a foiled plot to carry out an attack at Taylor Swift's concert in Vienna on Sunday sought to play down the seriousness of the plan, saying her client was only playing with ideas. Swift's three planned concerts last week were canceled after Austrian authorities discovered a plot allegedly led by a 19-year-old to carry out an Islamic State-inspired suicide attack at a stadium where tens of thousands of fans were planning to attend the shows. 
Austrian investigators said the suspect had recently sworn a pledge to the IS group and had made a full confession after police raided his house, seizing chemicals, machetes, and other devices the plotters planned to use in a bomb attack. Lawyer Inna Kristin Stiglitz told Reuters the suspect had only been involved with IS for the past month. It interested him, she said, suggesting that her client had not really intended to carry out a serious attack. It was just playing with ideas, she said. He says the bomb wasn't of good enough quality. It wouldn't have worked. He had researched online on how to build a bomb, she added. Among three other teenagers Austrian police have detained in the investigation was a 17-year-old whom Stiglitz said the 19-year-old had described as his best friend and neighbor. Neighbors of the 19-year-old in the small town of Ternitz expressed shock at his arrest, describing him as reserved but friendly. One of few hints pointing to potential radicalization was that he had recently grown a long beard, they said. Responding to a question about why he had changed his appearance, his lawyer said uh, he wanted to be cool. Chancellor Karl Nehammer, Nehammer, said earlier that Austria's intelligence agencies should have greater power to monitor communications on messaging apps to stop extremists. Israel expands orders for evacuations in the Gaza Strip by Nadel al-Mugrabi in Cairo. Israel expanded evacuation orders in Khan Yunus in the southern Gaza Strip overnight, forcing tens of thousands of Palestinian residents and displaced families to leave in the dark as explosions from tank shelling reverberated around them. The Israeli military said it was attacking militants from the Hamas group, which administered Gaza before the war, who were using those areas to stage attacks and fire rockets. On Saturday, an Israeli airstrike on a school where displaced Palestinians were sheltering in Gaza City killed at least 90 people, according to the Civil Defense Service, which is Hamas, run, prompting an international outcry. The Israel military said that it had struck a Hamas and Islamic Jihad militant command post, an allegation the two groups rejected as a pretext, and Israel claimed that they had killed 19 militants. In Khan Yunus, in the south of the Gaza Strip, the evacuation instruction covered districts in the center east and west, making it one of the largest such orders in the 10-month-old conflict, two days after tanks returned to the east of the city. The announcement was posted on X and in text and audio messages to residents' phones. For your own safety, you must evacuate immediately to the newly created humanitarian zone. The area you are in is considered a dangerous combat zone. Philippe Lazzarini, head of the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees, the UNRWA, said people in Gaza were trapped and had nowhere to go. Some are only able to carry their children with them, some carry their whole lives in one small bag, he said. They're going to overcrowded places where shelters are already overflowing with families, and they've lost everything, and they need everything. The Israeli army said it had struck around 30 Hamas military targets in the previous 24 hours, including military structures, anti-tank missile launch posts, and weapons facilities. Later on Sunday, an Israeli airstrike near the Khan Yunus market at the center of the city killed four Palestinians and wounded several others, medics said. Nearly 40,000 Palestinians have been killed in the Israeli offensive in Gaza since the war broke out last October after terrorists killed 1,300, killed and raped and murdered 1,300 Israelis, and that toll is rising by the day, the Gaza Health Ministry says. The Gaza Health Ministry is run by Hamas. Most of Gaza's 2.3 million people have been displaced from their homes, according to the United Nations, while their narrow strip of land has largely been reduced to a wasteland of rubble. Palestinian and United Nations officials say there are no safe areas in the enclave. Areas designated as humanitarian zones like Al-Mawasi in western Khan Yunus, where residents were being sent, have been bombed several times by Israeli forces. We're exhausted. This is the 10th time I and my family have been asked to leave our shelter, said Zaki Mohammed, who's 28 years old, who lives in the Hamad housing project in western Khan Yunus, where the occupants of two multi-floor buildings were ordered to leave. To leave. And with that, we've come to the end of our reading of the Standard Times for August 12th of 2024. This is your reader, Eric, saying be well.
be safe, look after each other. Remember our veterans, especially those who've passed recently. Bye for now.